Well, hello and good morning, everyone, um, to our webinar today, which we'll be looking at the learning from the Life Changes Trust funding for peace support projects for people living with dementia and for unpaid carers. I don't know what the weather's like um, where, where you are watching from today, but um, it might be a warm welcome, but a very wet welcome as well. So I hope you're, you're sitting very comfortably and indoors to enjoy this morning's event. My name is Alan Crockett and I'm the Director of Evidence and Influencing for the Dementia Programme here at the Life Changes Trust and it's a privilege to be chairing today's event. Before we get started, I just have a few very quick housekeeping um, points to make and to cover just so that things are comfortable for you. This webinar will last around one hour and 20 minutes with no break in the programme. But if you do need some time away from your screen, then please feel free to do so. That's absolutely no problem. This event has been recorded and will be available on the Life Changes Trust website very soon. It means then that you can catch up on anything that you've missed or you can share with colleagues or others who will be interested. We will email everyone who has registered today with um, the link when it's available. Later in the webinar, we'll have a Q&A panel session, which we're very excited about. Our panel will include some of the fantastic people who run the peer support projects, as well as Grant Gibson, who was involved in the evaluation of the projects, as well as our very own Andrina Coburn from the Life Changes Trust. I would like um, just to remind you, if you want to ask a question of the panel, you can do that by putting your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And there's also a chat section that you'll see there too. So please use this if you have any general comments. Just a point of note, you'll see in the chat function that there is a drop, drop down menu. This gives you the option to share your comments with the panel or with everyone. It's always good for us to see each other's comments and feedback, so please remember to select the with everyone option so that um, people can get access to that. So thanks for your patience and now on to today's event. So a wee bit of history here for you. Back in 2015, the Life Changes Trust Dementia Programme funded six peer support projects to run for five years. They were Vocal's Peer Mentoring Service, Outside the Boxes Food and Garden Buddies Project, Northwest Carers Centre Side by Side Project, Health and Mind, Enables Cuppa Club, and Caretus with their decafes. People with dementia and unpaid carers say that the support of their peers is something that they value the most. It helps to keep people more socially connected, giving them confidence and motivation to participate in their communities and friendship circles. It helps them feel valued by being listened to and being able to help others with similar experiences. It fosters a sense of belonging. With the support and encouragement of these projects, people with dementia and unpaid carers have shared their experiences and expertise, not just amongst themselves, but with health and social care workers, students, doctors, local businesses and universities. Participants have co-produced resources which are being used to change the way that services are being delivered and ensuring that people with dementia and carers are consulted and truly involved in care provision. By funding these projects, we at the Trust have gained a far deeper understanding of the broad range of benefits that peer support can provide for people with dementia and for unpaid carers. The evidence from the Trust-funded peer support projects, which you will hear about in this webinar, has and will continue to contribute to the growing body of evidence that demonstrates the positive impact of peer support on the quality of life of people with dementia and of unpaid carers. With all of the projects we have funded, we also commissioned an evaluation and our peer support initiative was no exception. The University of Stirling were commissioned to carry out this work and their report looks at the impact of our peer support funding and what the key, key learning has been. This morning, we will be hearing from Grant Gibson from the University, who will explore the key learning from the evaluation, as well as um, this, we will also hear from Leslie Aikenhead, who was a volunteer community researcher on the project about her experience. We'll also hear from Michelle Candlish from Curtis, one of the peer support projects funded by the Trust. She'll be talking to Chris Catt, who benef benefited from this support as an unpaid carer. And once we have heard about this learning, we'll then have that Q&A panel session. 
towards the end of the webinar. But we're getting started today with a short film made by Alistair Cox for the University of Stirling, for the University of Stirling, sorry, which gives a brief overview of the core outcomes from the six funded peer support projects and looks at some key elements around successful and effective peer support. So let's take a look.
many thanks to Alistair for that overview, which just gives a little flavour of what effective peer support can achieve and the impact on people living with dementia and unpaid carers who attended the projects. So now moving on, we are going to take a deeper dive into the evaluation that we mentioned that was carried out by the University of Stirling. The evaluation looked at the extent to which peer support contributed to better lives for people living with dementia and unpaid carers, and what were the key elements for successful peer support projects and the outcomes for those who attended the projects. So, Grant Gibson from the University of Stirling was one of those researchers on the evaluation. So let's hear from him now on what some of the key elements and outcomes were. Over to Grant. Hi, my name's Grant Gibson, and in this video, I'm going to report on an, an evaluation of a network of six peer support projects funded by the Life Changes Trust as part of their peer support programme. Um, I was a member of a team of three academics, myself, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Catherine Pemble and Dr. Jane Robertson, as well as four community researchers who worked with us, uh, Leslie Aitkenhead, Rog Harrison, Kim Strachan and Sheila Thorburn. In this recording, I'm going to discuss the project and its methods before presenting some of our findings regarding the success of the peer support program in providing peer support to people with dementia and to their carers. So to give a little bit of background, uh, in 2015, uh, the Life Changes Trust uh, launched a program uh, to fund peer support projects. And as part of this program, funded six projects providing peer-based support to people living with dementia and unkept paid carers across Scotland. The six projects provided a variety of forms of peer-based support uh, and did so using a variety of initiatives and activities. Some of these activities included peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, uh, support groups and peer-focused activities such as walking groups, cooking sections or gardening projects. Uh, the specific goals of the peer support program were to keep people living with dementia and their carers more socially connected with others, to give people living with dementia and their carers more confidence and motivation to participate in their communities, and to help people living with dementia to feel valued by being listened to and being able to help others with similar experiences. And all this had the, the ultimate goal of helping people with dementia experience a greater sense of confidence, of independence and well-being, as well as being able to exert more control and more choice over their lives. So uh, for the uh, peer support pro uh, project that we were commissioned to evaluate, uh, our evaluation project goals were one, to determine whether and how peer support contributes to better lives uh, for beneficiaries of the initiatives, as well as for their family, friends, and for the community and society more widely, to identify and demonstrate good practice in delivering peer support uh, with a specific focus on the facilitators and barriers to successful and effective peer support support, forms of partnership working ex exhibited by the various peer support projects, and how the projects sought to sustain their services and to achieve sustainability and long-term impact. Uh, finally, our goal was to disseminate evidence about what works for effective peer support to promote greater awareness and learning around peer support activities across Scotland and to really sort of demonstrate the benefits and the, the beneficial effects of peer support. Um, we included six projects in our peer support evaluation. I won't talk about these projects in detail. There's more detail in the report that's been circulated at this event as well. Um, four of the projects uh, managed to continue for the lifetime of the, the five years of funding. Two of the projects, unfortunately, Enable Scotland's Cuppa Club and Health in Mind's A Sense of Me project uh, did have to close early. Uh, so our evaluation focused predominantly on the four um, organisations that carried on for the length of the program, uh, but we did it. We were also able to draw on some information collected from Enable and from Health in Mind as well. So to describe our methodology, one of the, the, the key characteristics of our, our methodology for the evaluation was that it was co-produced with our four peer researchers. Um, the people I mentioned at the beginning of this recording uh, were all older people involved in community programs, including peer support programs for older people, for people with dementia. Um, many of them have worked with us on a number of co-produced projects in the past and have developed real skills and expertise as community researchers doing research research with people with dementia. 
Um, we used a variety of methods within our evaluation. Uh, first, we carried out a secondary qualitative analysis of uh, the various forms of self-evaluation data collected by each of the projects. Um, one of the characteristics of any project funded by the Life Changes Trust is, um, is that um, they go through an extensive process of self-evaluation and we were able to use that data within our own analysis. This was complemented by a series of 21 semi-structured interviews Views with project beneficiaries, project staff and volunteers, as well as six focus groups with project staff and volunteers as well. Uh, we also complemented the qualitative data collection with a social return on investment analysis, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about what this involves later on. Uh, and this culminated with the production of the final report that's being launched today. Uh, and in this report details the, the findings of the project in much more detail than I'm going to talk about today uh, and gives detailed findings for each project as well as across the entire peer support program. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail today, but it is fair to say that the COVID-19 pandemic did lead to significant challenges for our evaluation and significant challenges for all of the peer support projects. This did lead to some substantial project redesigns and it did affect and reduce the scope of what we were able to originally do within our evaluation. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, so we identified four key factors that influence success across the peer support projects. And I'm going to talk about these cross-cutting factors over the next few slides. Uh, so the first was the importance of staff and staffing. And unsurprisingly, staff were always going to be crucial, but this very much was clear from our analysis. Staff were valued as being empathetic, as being trustworthy, knowledgeable and accessible, as well as displaying uh, a high degree of commitment and adapt uh, adaptability. There was certainly a strong sense of staff going the extra mile to meet the needs of their clients, and this can be seen in the quote presented here. One issue that I would raise that did arise that was a barrier to um, organizations, however, was that high degrees of staff turnover were a pretty common experience amongst the projects. And this could cause significant difficulties in terms of continuity of service and in terms of continuity of contact for project clients. Our second theme was uh, relates to funding. Unsurprisingly, uh, funding is a big issue and continues to be a big issue for these kind of community based projects. And we did find that even taking the, the five years of funding that projects were able to gain from the Life Changes Trust, which is a really long sustained period of funding, many projects were still found themselves dependent on chasing short term funding sources. And this meant that a number of the projects could find themselves being quite precariously placed and it did have a, a role in why two of the projects um, had to close their doors prior to, uh, before the end of the program. Staff needed to spend a significant amount of time chasing funding, making applications to various organizations, uh, which could well mean that they couldn't spend that time with their clients. And it could also mean that organizations could see each other as competitors. And this came through at times, although it was also interesting and stark to find that many of the organizations did coordinate and share information about the availability of funding with each other. Uh, we also found that these kind of funding issues were very much exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, not least because projects were finding themselves having to significantly redesign their services, needing funding to support that at a time when many funding sources actually started to dry up. Cultivating uh, partnerships and networks with other organizations was a key element of the projects as well. Unsurprisingly, all the organizations we worked with found themselves part of a much wider ecosystem of both state and third sector support agencies and community organizations. Uh, so how these organizations fitted in with this wider ecosystem was, was important in determining the success of those projects. Um, all the projects described developing a range of networks, partnerships and collaborations, and these were very much vital to their ability to both access and support their clients. Uh, but one finding that did come out um, from several of the projects was that when this involved integrating with particularly statutory services such as health and social care, uh, this could be particularly challenging and time consuming to build these networks and relationships. And this could be a bit of a barrier barrier at times for organizations being able to reach the clients that they needed to reach. Uh, encouraging peer, uh, peer participation was a key goal of the projects as well. Um, 
clearly given the focus of the projects on providing peer support, being able to bring in um, people with dementia to provide that support to each other is a key aspect of the projects. Uh, but we did find that um, many of the, the groups found that they were most successful if they were able to access people relatively early in the dementia journey. But this could be quite difficult because many found that people didn't engage with the projects until they faced often quite severe need. Uh, creating safe and supportive spaces as well as networking with neighbouring organisations was a key aspect of how they addressed this difficulty. Um, but we did note that some carers in some of the organisations expressed a tendency for groups to avoid what they called hard questions, um, avoiding topics that might be seen as difficult or sensitive to deal with for people at different stages of the dementia journey. And th this, this did suggest that there was a place for different types of peer support to be offered within a single organization and this was something many of the organizations did. Uh, so moving on to our social return on investment analysis and to give you a little bit of background about what a social return on investment analysis is. It's a form of cost effectiveness analysis and a cost benefit tool that can be used to identify uh, the level of social value that can be generated by community based activities such as peer support. Uh, the way that it does this is by attributing a, a financial proxy amount in pounds for, that represents the social value of uh, some of the outcomes from a particular activity or a particular project. Uh, we went through an exercise of um, collecting data from the various projects about their outcomes and the benefits they had for their, um, for their clients. And we were able to use this to generate uh, the social value uh, calculations displayed here. And what was significant is that we see that across the organizations, all four of the organizations we were able to do an SROI for demonstrated clear social value. They clearly um, led to increased social value when compared to the level of investment in them. Um, at its smallest, we saw this being where um, one pound of investment led to four pounds worth of social value. And in the highest, we saw one pound of investment leading to 15 pounds of social value. Now, it is important to note that a higher social value does not necessarily mean that that service is better than the other services. Uh, the level of social value determined by each of the services very much depended on factors such as the number of people they were able to access, the range of activities being provided, but also the scope of the projects. And some projects, because they chose to focus on particular groups or particular ways of um, providing peer support, that meant that for some services, the, the social value was higher than in others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one project is better than another. So bringing this section to a conclusion, what did we feel were the main factors that influenced the delivery of peer support projects? Well, we identified sort of five points along the, the sort of the timeline in which peer support projects were developed. So first, at the initial phases of setting up projects, we found that it was important for projects to clearly identify a purpose, clearly identify their client groups and clearly identify their aims and objectives, as well as identify identifying mechanisms and, and tools that they can use to actually measure and determine what the, the benefits or what the outcomes of their projects are. Uh, a key element of this was all, uh, these early stages was also communic communicating the goals of their particular projects and activities across the, the local network of community organizations, as well as focusing on, on recruiting the right staff as soon as possible. At the next stage of project inputs, uh, we considered that ensuring that there's a consistent supply of funding to these organizations and staffing to these organizations is, is pretty crucial. Uh, current funding setups do mean that it can be difficult to achieve both of these elements, and, and this might require a rethink of actually how community organizations such as the projects are funded. Um, more widely, we found that um, it was important for, for projects to start to build their own networks and collaborate with other organizations. And we found that reciprocity of helping other organizations in the hope that they would help them as well uh, seemed to be um, the mechanism through which these kind of relationships could be built.
Uh, at the stage of continuing product uh, project development, uh, we found a key goal was moving towards sustainability, particularly in relation to funding sources, as well as ensuring that projects are accessible to the range of stakeholders and clients that they've identified and can continue to develop that community reach is also a key element as projects continue to evolve and develop. Uh, in terms of the activities and outputs coming out of each project, we felt we felt from our work that it was important to tailor support to individuals to ensure that there were safe and secure environments, both sort of physically, but also emotionally uh, for people to be able to engage with each other and to engage with the organizations, as well as building strategic approaches across the networks that they have of, of knowing which partners they wanted to work with and which partners could help them in which specific ways. Finally, in terms of reporting things like benefits and outcomes, we found that it was important to share information and resources about the projects, as well as sharing the lived experience of clients and peers and their experiences of taking part in the projects as well. Uh, both of those were clearly important in terms of being able to state what the outcomes of a project are. And then finally, and once again, continuing to build that community engagement so that the benefits of the projects can be shared with other organizations and within other communities. So that's the end of our presentation. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and useful. Um, there is a Q&A session later in the day that I'll be um, a member of the panel for that. But if any of you would like to contact me directly, you can reach me on Twitter at Dr. Grant Gibson or via my university email address at grantgibson, grant.gibson at stir.ac.uk. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of this launch event. So many thanks to Grant Gibson and to the University of Stirling. As part of the evaluation, Grant and the University of Stirling also called on the expertise of some volunteer community researchers, and Grant referenced that in his presentation. They were people in the community who had experience of or an interest in dementia and or evaluation and research experience, and who wanted to get involved in the project and may have been involved in projects previously as well with the university. Leslie Aitkenhead was one of these community researchers who had experience of evaluation in the past and currently runs a small community peer support project herself. She is also a family carer for her mum who has dementia. She speaks about what her experience was like, working in the project and the impact it had on her. So let's meet Leslie. My name is Leslie Aikenhead and I was a volunteer on the peer support evaluation project run by Stirling University. I found out about the project from a post on LinkedIn. I wanted to get involved as a family carer for my mother who was diagnosed with vascular dementia over 15 years ago. I also run a small community peer support group and was interested to hear about other peer support groups. I have experience in project and risk management and have also conducted many audits and evaluation reviews within the financial services industry. So I was keen to understand how evaluation is undertaken in the charity sector. The research team encouraged the volunteers to get involved in a way that worked for them, allowing us to balance the project with other commitments. I was delighted to be involved in many different aspects of the project gave me the opportunity to share my skills and personal experience, but also to benefit from learning research takes and working closely with the team. I helped with project planning and reporting, developing creative tools and materials, analysis of interviews, and contributing to the dissemination of the findings. Well, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone that peer support groups are beneficial to everyone involved. They're designed to address gaps in health and social care, and the benefits are well documented. The work of all the peer support groups was hugely beneficial, and the benefits went beyond people living with dementia, including the volunteers and the local community. For me, one of the most interesting areas of the project was how we measure the benefits. Each of the projects operated differently. This is an area of real interest, particularly as a carer, 
and as someone involved in a small charity and as a board trustee. We know that funders will always be looking for ways that charities can demonstrate the benefit of their services. But how do you measure something like peer support? Well, the research project used a mixed method approach to valuating. Recognising that some benefits are less visible and only captured through interaction with members of the group. The area that I found the most interesting with the financial background was the social return on investment. It was used to assess the financial benefit of the groups. For every one pound invested, what was the direct or indirect financial benefit? This was interesting as it highlighted the challenges in capturing this type of data and included many caveats. It was far from perfect, but it gave some useful insight into how benefits can be measured and what data charities need to think about capturing in order to really sell their value. This highlighted the need to find a more holistic way of measuring benefits, rather than trying to find things that can be easily counted. How many members? How many volunteers? That doesn't equate to how much value you provide. I felt the project team benefited from using volunteers. Although I wouldn't refer to myself as older, I think it gave a different perspective. I know from working in the private sector that there's a lot of overlap in methods of evaluation, but involving your customers, getting different stakeholder input helps you to look at things differently. Working as critical friends. One example was the videos and reports. The volunteers and community researchers helped to give a different perspective, an audience perspective, which I think helped the outputs be more engaging and less academic. The evaluation was clearly impacted by COVID and the team had to find a different way to engage with peer support groups. I felt this was managed very successfully. The project considered a number of different ways of engaging with stakeholders. However, as a volunteer, I would have liked to be more connected with the groups, to meet them in person and talk about their experiences. But I recognise that due to restrictions, the online approach was the only option. Key learnings for me were around the need to find a more holistic way of resourcing projects and measuring the benefits. I feel that funders should take more responsibility for building relationships with their projects and understanding the challenges and aspirations. I think this will help develop a longer and more sustainable funding strategy. Many thanks to Leslie um, for giving her, you know, her ref reflections as a volunteer community researcher and also to all the volunteer community researchers who brought an important and valuable contribution in terms of their experience to the evaluation process. Before we hear from our next project, I just want to remind you not to forget to put some questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and also to put any comments in the chat section and again just to share with everyone rather than just to panellists. So next we're going to hear from Michelle Candlish, who is a dementia link worker at Curtis, one of the Life Changes Trust funded peer support projects. Curtis run support groups called D-Cafes across Eastern Bartonshire, located in Kirkintillic, Bishop Briggs, Lindsay and Bearsden. These projects provide a safe and supportive space for people living with dementia and for unpaid carers to meet, take part in activities and speak with others who share similar experiences. Michelle caught up with Chris Katz, whose husband Richard has frontal temporal dementia. They both attend D cafes, which provide not only the peer support and activity connection mentioned before, but also signposting to other organisations who provide support in the area. I'll now hand you over to Michelle and to Chris to explain more. Thanks for coming this morning and agreeing to just talk a little bit about the D cafe and what it means to you and if it's made any differences. How, how did you hear about the D Cafe? Um, I went 
to the Alzheimer Cafe over at the, which is in the east end of Glasgow. So that was like the other side of the city for me. So um, when I was there, I made some contacts and they directed me back to this part of the city. Um, and Kirtas, I suppose, and no, wait a minute, and, Angie and she works for um, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So that was the contact. And then I, I'm not really sure, but I think maybe Angie put me in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Killermont Cafe, which was like, you know, geographically the nearest place. Um, and at that time, Richard wasn't interested in doing anything like that. And um, so I just came on a few times. And, and what was your first impression for coming in? Um, well, it was a nice building, which helped. You know, it was nice and open and airy <clears throat> and not too church-like. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, it was uh, first impressions were good. And people, oh, it was lovely cakes. Somebody that yeah. I think I think some places the cakes are better than others. Is that right? Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But there was like really nice sponges. And it was like, well, I'll try not to eat too much because there's lots of delicious things that laid out. And people were really friendly. And it was mostly couples. And it was just interesting speaking to people about you know different stages of dementia and um, just chatting to them, you know, just just seeing people uh, was good because I think already by that time our social contacts weren't that you know we didn't weren't that numerous. Um, yeah, there wasn't a lot happening, so it was nice just to meet people and, and chat, and you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh huh. So, at what kind of what would you say? Um, so, if you were explaining a D cafe to somebody and you somebody was saying to you, what do you do at it? What happens? You know, you have guest speakers. What would you, how would you explain it? What kind of things do you experience yeah, well, there? What I remember is um, there was a couple who actually um, support the charity. And I've forgotten their names, but he played the guitar. And he sang. He was, he was actually quite good. I think he's actually, you know, he's sort of amateur performer. So there was music quite often and there was interesting talks. Yeah, there's people coming along to talk about things that were relevant, you know, like safety and um, other things. I didn't always get to everyone. Um, I think that's the other thing. It was quite relaxed. You know, I didn't feel I had to turn up every week and you know, not to be bang on time or anything like that, you know, which would be a, an issue sometimes, you know, when you're taking somebody else around. So, yeah, it was, it was all very relaxed and, and uh, you know, pleasant atmosphere. And um, so, what, would there be anything that you have um, taken forward from from going to D Cafe and being connected with Curtis, you know, getting information? Is there any, was, any projects or anything I mean, that you Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I first started going to the cafe, I really didn't know that much about frontotemporal dementia. I mean, it's one thing to read about it, mm -hmm. but to actually meet people who knew people who had frontotemporal dementia, which is what my husband's got, was really helpful. <clears throat> it was it was painful as well because it's not a nice disease, you know, it was tough to hear it. But I, I've, at the time I wanted that information, you know, and that, that's where I got it really, um, was through the cafe largely. In a way that made sense to me, just to meeting people, you know, that I can speak to about it. So there's a few projects that you've got involved with already, I think Scottish Valley. Yeah, that's right. So you sent, you were good on the, the Zoom during COVID because, yeah, I just started going to like the Kilimanjaro Cafe for a few times and it had to stop because of COVID. So we're talking about March, a year past it now. Um, so yeah, you you were you got good on the communication. So Scott, Rich and I both was the first week, but after that he wasn't interested. But that was really interesting. That was very you know, creative sort of in a, an interesting way. And they sent us materials, you know, it was all very generous. But no, it passed for all was good. It was, I mean, I walked, found new places in Bears Den to walk, which was fun. Um, what else? There was other, what was something else about walks? Um, um, I don't think we got the link from you, but there was another charity called Frog Life. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Don't you, Louise? So uh -huh. we, we walked with her for uh, like once a week, I think, for a while in the winter when like the weather was really bad and nothing was happening. So that, that was good to go out with her. So yeah, walking walking's a good one. Um, we'll, we'll maybe get yes. Fiona along to speak at a D Cafe from Frog Life yeah. because I've just yeah. been introduced to her through Life Changes actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe she's somebody that we can get along um, to, to to speak. And I think what you were saying about the live music, the couple, the volunteers um, with the live music, yeah, that's really nice, and we can all just sit and, and, and enjoy the music and and you know just a 
sort of cafe atmosphere. Um, and also what you were saying about it being friendly and the baking, it definitely makes a difference to um, me as a worker if we've got um, volunteers and there's, there's a really good core group of volunteers at the Killam Church mm-hmm. Tea Cafe and they supply the baking um, and they, they just um, just help us just make people feel comfortable and just kind of offer that host, you know sort of hospitality. But yeah, the cakes always go down well. Um, no matter where we are. Um, so if you were to say, to, if there was somebody watching this, Chris, and they were think, you know, a bit apprehensive about maybe going to a group or sort of joining in somewhere, what would, you know, what would, how would you encourage them to, to get involved and come along? Yeah, well, I can think of someone in that situation and I would maybe just say, you know, come come with me, you know, I'll come with, or I'll come with you. Um and yeah, no, no commitment. I mean, that's it. You're not signing up to anything. Yeah, I would just say go along, give it a go. Why not? And if, if you've got quite a lot of cafes as well. It's not like there's just one place that's you know. If, if you have difficulty travelling, you know, there's more yeah, cafes. Yeah, there? there's a few throughout Eastern Bartonshire, and I usually tell people when they're starting off, try them all. Um, you can come to them all in different areas throughout Eastern Bartonshire. I can tell Bishop Briggs Lindsay um, and over here in Bears, um, Bears Den. And I'd say just try them all. And some people go to two. Um, but people are welcome to come along to all the cafes. They're all more or less the same, but some have got a slightly different um, just because of venue, and it definitely makes a difference for us when the, the volunteers are there, um, and we've got that that wee bit of home baking and the volunteers to do the music um, as well. So I can remember the first time you met Richard in person, you were like sh- surprised at how tall he was. Yes, you'd seen him on screen, and uh, that that worked really well for him. I mean, because I I'd been doing Zoom with a group that was my group. And the first time he joined Zoom with me was when we did a, um, a, a, an online with you. And it was about, the theme was music. And of course, he doesn't really say that much, but he, he showed everyone his LPs. Yeah. And he really sort of was able to make that connection and he really enjoyed it, you know. Um, so that, that was well, That was good. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good for me as well, just like putting a face. Um, and I think it was after then that he came along to the walk and I thought, oh my goodness, you're so tall. Yeah. Um, because all I'd seen him was, was sitting in the chair and I think we had even had a wee um, play with the ball because uh, there was a little net so we were shooting some <laughs> some balls into the net as well yeah, so yeah, yeah that was good yeah. another thing we did was uh, you, there was a magician who was very entertaining um, yes. I didn't always get to those meetings I can't remember I can't remember what the timing was but it didn't fit in with whatever we were doing which can't have been that important but um, we didn't always get to them but the ones we went to were, were always very entertaining and, uh, Chris, I think you enjoyed um, one that I really enjoyed as well, and it was um, an online disco, a Zoom disco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that that was a little bit different, but that was fun. <laughs> Lots of people enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, no, that was good. Remember arms um, and legs and sort of waving arms and you know, yeah, people were getting so, into sort of, you know. Yeah. yeah, we had to be a little bit inventive. We tried to be yeah. creative. Um, <laughs> And we've had some good guests. We've had, I don't know if you've been on any of our Zooms, but we've had guests from the Deep Network. Um, we've had uh, somebody on showing us how to make a garden. Um, it was a, a water feature. I'm not sure if you were on that one. So no, if I missed could, that. Could you with that, really? Yeah. That's become a competition to see who can get the best one. Um, so that, that's been good, inviting people from other, and you've met, people on the Zoom that go to other groups that you wouldn't normally have met mm-hmm. before? There was, the, there was the five groups that were really interesting. Yeah. Uh, the recipe book and everything. Yes. Um, I mean, they were they were just amazing. Um, I was really impressed with them. So are you looking forward to um, meeting, the, I know we're meeting on Monday um, for a, just a catch-up um, with the group, but are you really looking forward to meeting back the way that we did before yeah. COVID? Yeah. Because I, I came on my own initially because at that time um, Rich wasn't interested but he's much more he needs he, he needs to be directed much more now and he's letting me do that you know so you'll, you'll definitely be coming along this time so and I, you know and he does like socialising you know he still enjoys a lot of things and being around people he does enjoy as well he's, and he's quite up for going places so that will definitely work um, for us yeah 
Well, that's really good. So I look forward to, to seeing you both. We're getting, we're getting one step needed every day um, to getting back to normal. Yeah, yeah. So is there anything else that you want to say about the decafes or to anybody um, that might be watching or just a final um, sort of closing? Mm-hmm. No, I just encourage anyone to go because it's it's fun, it's casual, you just can't go wrong really and you'll probably learn something useful. Well, many thanks to Michelle and to Chris for their reflections on the peer support and what the groups can offer, both with access to frontline support and through connecting people with dementia and unpaid carers to other organisations and support groups. It was really interesting to hear from Chris actually about the projects she has been made aware of, like Paths for All and Scottish Ballet, through peer support and how this has really extended her network of support as well, and also being connected to other groups across Scotland, like um, Stands, and I know um, that Jerry's on the webinar today, so, so that'll be good for him to hear. So it's now time for our Q&A panel session. Great. You're all here, which is good. Um, so we're going to get started um, and I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourself. So first of all, Grant, do you want to say who you are and just a wee bit about why you're here today? Yep, that's fine. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Gibson. I'm a lecturer in Dementia Studies at the University of Stirling and I was a member of the evaluation team for the Peer Support Evaluation Project. Uh, the project was originally led by my colleague Jane Robertson, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Another two members were Kate Pemble and Raj Harrison, who were both actually in the chat. So if they both want to say hello in the chat as well. Thanks very much, Grant. Thank you. Um, and next, Carol, can you say a, a few things to introduce yourself as well? Hi everyone, I'm Carol Kelly. I'm Head of Carer Support at Vocal Carers Hub in Edinburgh. Um, and I manage all the Edinburgh-based services support non-paid carers, including the Life Changes Trust peer-funded project as well. Um, so we were involved in the, the evaluation project and um, we're, we've been lucky enough to be able to embed our peer project, although the funding from Life Changes Trust has finished, we've embedded it in our core support now through um, council funding. So it's wonderful mm. to be able to, to continue the, the great work that the peer mentors undertake in Edinburgh. That's good. And that'll be reassuring for people to hear as well, Carol, and I'm, I'm sure um, will be something that they're thinking about in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Anne, do you want to say a wee bit about yourself and, and what you do? Yeah. Um, hello to everyone. I'm Anne Connor. I'm Chief Executive at Outside the Box. And we were the, the base for the Food Buddies project. Well, it started off as Food Buddies. And then when you listen to people, and particularly when people with peer experience want to share it in different ways, it then developed off to lots of spin-offs with gardening and publications and learning for people working in cafes to make them more dementia friendly and lots more. Um, and the flexibility I think we got from Life Changes Trust as a funder was really important in making that flexibility and responsiveness happen. So it's lovely to be here at the, not the end of it, but the, the moving on to the next stage of life around peer support. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for sharing that. And last but by no means least, my colleague, Andrina, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Arlene. So I'm Andrina Coburn, and I'm one of the evidence and influencing coordinators on the Dementia Programme at the Life Changes Trust. Um, initially, back in 2015, when I started, I was um, one of the funding managers um, responsible for um, overseeing the peer support projects. Um, so I know quite a lot about them to be at the beginning and I was there for a few years and then I changed my role. Um, so laterally I've been more involved in liaising with the University of Stirling around the um, evaluation of the peer support projects. Thanks, Andina. Okay, so we're going to get started with some questions. First of all, I just want to draw attention to how fantastic the networking is going in the chat. 
I mean, a big part of um, the success of the peer support projects has been about networking, about partnership working, sharing experiences and learning, and, and we're seeing that today um, as part of this event. So, so brilliant to see that all happening and, and people getting involved. So first question is a question for all of the panel. So I'm not going to be specific with one person at the moment, but this is a question that's come through um, from the ch from the Q&A section. So what are the panel's thoughts on how peer support could be facilitated initially? So how do we get that started? Do the panel think that more formal health and social care services have a part to play in this? For example, by offering um, links to peers um, at that diagnosis stage, so that kind of connecting up. So do people have any thoughts on that? Maybe um, Carol and Anne, particularly from your point of view, being at that kind of front line in terms of providing support. What's your thoughts on that? Well, definitely um, health and social care partnership have a role to play in and certainly uh, they are best placed to refer um, carers to services where there is that um, diagnosis in place. So to get early intervention, we really need to um, encourage professionals to come forward to make those referrals to the third sector, I think is, is a key message. Um, unfortunately, with the COVID, that was quite badly affected as a lot of uh, professionals were redeployed elsewhere. So we're having to almost build up again those um, networks with our statutory partners. Um, <clears throat> one thing we have done over the last few months, however, in terms of developing peer support is to set up um, locality based uh, support groups and we wrote out to all our carers on our books to ask if there was interest in this and on the back of that we've been able to successfully set up four um, peer support uh, groups in each locality in Edinburgh and those are going really well so I think kind of reaching out to the communities of interest and, and just offering the opportunity you know it's just a great way to to set something up and for people to come forward and especially where it's group based you almost need that groundswell of uh, you know yeah. sufficient interest to be able to to set up a group so um that worked really well and and particularly at a time during covid when people were very isolated i think it, it's almost generated more interest than we might have found at, at other times actually so um that was a real positive development over the last few months that we've seen at vocal thanks carol and do you want to add anything to that yeah i, I think it's a really interesting question um in some ways it's two really interesting questions um, I think on the bit about um, workers and that peer role, um, I think my view, and I suppose I'm saying what I'm hearing from people living with dementia, affected by dementia, but also what we know from peer support work that we're involved in in, in other um, analysis situations, is that there are two actually quite different roles. One is the peer-to-peer -peer we just give each other using our life experience. And I think it's worth remembering that is something human beings do. And we've always done it and we always will. And then there are situations when either as a volunteer or a worker, someone is intentionally and explicitly using their life experience in that role. And I think that's often what we're talking about when it's the health and social care side of it. This has been happening actually for about the past 10 years or so in mental health services. And I think it's some really interesting learning and Scottish Recovery Network is a good place to look to for really interesting learning about peer workers in health and social care settings and how that's worked and what protects everybody and, and what, what makes it a... Uh, and an added strength over what a really good um, worker or volunteer who doesn't have that lived experience brings. And so there's that side of it. But I think there's something about remembering what peer support is and not turning it into a service um, because both are important. It, it's not one or the other, um, it, it, it's both. And I also, I think Carol's right about what we've seen over particularly the last two years is that bit about people wanting to share, wanting to connect with other people. How are you dealing with this? And the experience of five years ago outside COVID isn't partly what I need. I need to know this. <clears throat> how are you managing now with the restrictions? Or how are you managing now with things that are happening in our area? 
And I think it's that bit about it's constant and it's continual. And what I would like to see is a lot more, Carol says, a lot more services building this in. Um, I suppose trying to get it going is understanding some of the barriers. And I think sometimes people who are more used to service delivery and looking after people in, in, in different ways, whether it's care or social care or other things, ask all the questions about um, is everybody PV, is everyone who's doing peer support PVG checked? And you're thinking, no, because neighbours and friends don't do that. But there are really good ways we know of keeping everyone safe and of knowing when somebody's feeling, oh, this is getting a bit too deep for me. And that's maybe, it's actually harder to do, but that's maybe a better conversation. Um, so it's, it's understanding why, what are the concerns and worries people have, and then thinking, right, each one of those we can deal with. We, we can find a way to make that, where we do know ways across our collective knowledge, we know ways to make that work. And I think absolutely sharing what the impact is when people have that peer support, which no professional, no worker is going to be able to give in, in the same way. They do other things and they do them really well, but it doesn't replace that, that peer understanding, sometimes saying, yeah, there isn't a solution to that. It's horrible, isn't it? And virtually or in real life, I'm giving you a hug. Um, but that's it. We're going to hold hands and we're going to do it together. Um, as well as saying, hmm, have you tried this? Or if that doesn't work, have you tried that? And building up that kind of bit. So, yeah, absolutely finding different ways to get it happening in, in both settings would be would be really, really good. And I hope that's one of the, the spin-offs that comes from all of this. Thanks, Anne, that you make really important points. And I think at the end of the day, we need to remember that it's it's people, you know, we're working with people and there needs to be a lot of different things considered in relation to that. And they need to have the options that are available to them and what works for them. And, and that, that might change, you know, it might work in one way at one time and then that might change in um, the next time. So you're absolutely right. Really, really clear and important points, both from, from Anne and from Carol. And Gina Grant, do you have anything to add before I move on to the next question? Um, I think uh, Anne and Carol have, have covered most of the main points. And certainly from the point of view of the evaluation, we did find that one of the issues that some of the uh, some of the projects could find were, was accessing and you know sort of promoting their uh, their activities, their their groups out to people, and health and social care services were a, a key sort of partner in doing that. Um, but we did find that um, it could regularly be very difficult to build, initially build, and then sustain those relationships and sustain those partnerships. And that was definitely true during the, the pandemic, which kind of heightened that experience quite significantly. But it, it was kind of an experience that was already there. Um, and, and yes, there is this dilemma about not wanting to turn peer support projects into a, a kind of a, a health and social care service provided by the third sector. Um, but there are the... Places like GP surgeries, for example, do play a really crucial role in signposting people to the, the wider array of community supports that are out there. Um, so it, it's kind of, it is important that, that they are aware, if not of the organisations themselves, but of organisations that can signpost through to the wider array of peer support or community support services that are, that are in a particular town or locality. That's, that's really crucial. And um, we can't really get away from, from those services actually playing a really important position in, in that signposting people through. Okay. Um, and Gina, before I move on, thank you um, for that. Are you okay? For yeah, well, I would agree with what everyone said. I suppose I, I have heard of peer support um services within hospitals you know at the point of diagnosis but I think maybe the point of diagnosis is maybe not the best time to offer something like that and I think um, as everyone has said it's really just having that available and making sure that people know that it's there uh, when they feel that it's the right time for them and when they need it and that it's based in the community and it's not in a clinical setting and um, yeah because that takes away the, the kind of meaning of peer support I think so. 
Thanks, Andina. And just, just picking up my comment in the chat from Graeme Galloway to say that, you know, it, it's completely right not turning peer support into a service. This is something that health and social care partnerships can struggle with and often not seeing the benefit of the community-based support that, that peer support is um, that, that like this. And so it's really good to see not just an evaluation report that, that highlights the impact and, and, and what it means for people with dementia and unpaid carers, but also that we have the SROI figures and assessment as well. So, so thanks, Graeme, for that. We have a question that's come in from the chat from Jerry King from Stand, who is the group that was mentioned in the film before. Um, so Jerry wants to know, and this is connected with, with, with some of the, the points that you made, Anne. Um, what does the panel think about people living with dementia, so with a diagnosis of dementia, facilitating peer support themselves rather than volunteers and carers? So we'll maybe start um, with you, Anne, this time, if you don't mind. Well, yes. Um, I mean, I'm coming to this from a project that didn't run groups. So I know that peer support happens in a zillion other ways. Um, yes, it can happen in groups, and that sometimes is a helpful starting point for some people, but it also happens in lots and lots of other ways. Um, and I, I think, again, it's that bit about what is it. I, I, I was really interested in, in the descriptions um, that were made about the cafes, about um, having people around and just making sure the tea and the cakes and the coffees are there. Um, and I think there's that bit, there's different kinds of support that volunteers and other people can give to make it a comfortable, friendly setting, but not necessarily. And what do we mean by facil is it facilitating a conversation? Is it just getting it started and then drifting off? So, yeah, I think it's a good question. And I think it opens up that bit about what's happening and um, how does it look to other people? What's going on in, in, in that setting? Um, but definitely thinking about how do people with lived experience um, of dementia, living with dementia themselves. I, I think there's one bit about this often we think, well, it can work that way for carers, but not for people living with dementia. And again, it's that bit about let's assume it can and push that as far as it goes and support that to go a bit further and then think when in these settings does it something need or these circumstances does something need a bit more support so yeah maybe try flipping it thanks Anne Carol what's your thoughts given that obviously you, your project is focused on on carers but your thoughts on in relation to that I think you know we need to focus on what people can do rather than yeah. what they can't do and, and to support them to do what they can do as well as they can do that. And, and people will require different support at different times. Um, all of us, you know, regardless of whether we have a, a, a condition or not. So I think that that's, for me, the sort of basic principle that we need to operate from is how can we support people to do what they want to do in life? And, you know, I don't think there should be barriers in the way to um, enabling people with dementia to to run groups or to to do whatever they, they choose to do. I mean, I'm conscious there's a forthcoming conference which is specifically for people with dementia. Um, and I think that's just a wonderful idea because it will challenge preconceptions and stereotypes about what people with dementia are capable of achieving. Um, and so I think, you know, more of that kind of initiative should be showcased within society. Um, and, and so that it becomes more normalised that people with different health conditions can equally run and deliver um, support to others. Mm -hmm. I'm just picking up on the, the question I think Grant had put in the chat around, you know, with the projects, was there any, you know, activities um, that, that people with dementia were directly involved in in terms of peer support? And, Jean, I don't know, given that you were you there from the very start in terms of, you know, the projects being funded and, and then those kind of early conversations, was there anything particularly around what the projects were, were going to deliver that was exclusively about people with dementia directly involved? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but um, you know, a lot of the projects, activities, like Anne said, for example, you know, the ones around food, um, it wasn't necessarily about somebody leading that. It was about people participating and then, you know, someone being around to support. And I think um, as long as people feel like they're in a, in a safe environment where they can share and 
I, I know that um, in the report it mentioned that sometimes topics come up, I think it was more for carers, that can be quite distressing or quite difficult to talk about. I think as long as people are aware of that and acknowledge that, that can happen and that they feel safe sharing and that they're emotionally supporting each other through that, then um, I don't see any, any barriers to that. Thanks, Andrina. That's really helpful. OK, so we'll move on. And thanks, Jerry, for that question. That's definitely um, sparked some thoughts, I think, and, and some ideas from, from our panel and from others on the chat. OK, so, Carol, one for you, and this is probably around, more around how we've had to adapt to COVID and, and projects have had to adapt, and it was mentioned in the evaluation by, um, by Grant. So, during COVID, what do you think have been the benefits for unpaid carers participating in online peer support? I think it really opened up opportunities for um, carers who previously had perhaps felt quite housebound or were struggling to really um, get to places where these activities were delivered. Um, so it's really turned that on its head and people can now access support from, you know, within their own home if they choose to. So for some carers, um, it really widened the opportunities that were available to them. Um, for others, um, it was almost the complete opposite effect because statutory supports um, sort of vanished overnight, particularly uh, daycare for older people's services had a massive impact on carers' ability to, to really have time to themselves. Um, so I think for, for me, the informal support that could be offered through our peer mentor service was extremely valuable to carers who perhaps didn't have access to the support that traditionally they would have been able to um, benefit from. So I think, you know, those sort of informal tips, ideas, the shared experiences that the peer mentors could offer to other carers was really beneficial because it was much more about that kind of the informal um, networks, the, the personal strengths and assets that, that people have and building on those and, and kind of almost try to recreate a new form of support in the absence of, um, you know, those traditional supports that were no longer there. Mm. Thanks very much. Carol, does anybody have anything else to add to that before I, I move on to our final question? No? No, no takers? OK, that's fine. Well, I'll move on to our final question. Sorry if I've not been able to catch everybody's questions today. It's just that we are limited for time, but you certainly will be able to pick up with our panel members at any time. Just make direct contact with them. And obviously, there's a wealth of information in the evaluation as well and, and in the summary reports from the projects. So, Grant, the, the final question is for you. Um, so, were there any findings in the evaluation that you didn't expect to see? Um, I'm not sure about not expecting to see them. I, um, I think there were there were three um, that we sort of highlighted across the the academic team on the evaluation that I can talk about that that were much more pronounced than I think we originally expected. So the first one I would say uh, was actually the importance of networks and partnership working with other peer support organisations and with the wider sort of, let's call it an ecosystem of community-based support organisations, volunteer groups, um, third sector organisations, for example. Um, that was, we, we expected that to play a role, but what was a little surprising and certainly very heartening to see was just how well networks the various organizations tended to be within uh, you know within their own communities and that was a really positive element and i think that's that's an element that comes through strongly through the, the work of the trust overall um in providing a kind of a scaffold for those networks to build um so that that struck that the, the importance of that was the first thing i think that stuck to mind that really struck us um, the second point I'd say, uh, and this reflects uh, one of the, the comments from, from Jerry in the chat as well, was the importance of a sort of a, a more co-produced model within the peer support organisations as well. And we were, we were certainly pleased to see that, that that was at the core of, of 
most, if not all, of the organisation's activities. So there was this sense that people with dementia and carers weren't just attendees within the organisation's activities, but actually played a, a direct role and if not a direct role, an indirect role in, in informing the kind of activities that took place and, and what happened during those t- activities and how, how people with dementia and carers were able to, to support each other. And of course, the, you know, the core element is we, we call these projects peer support projects. So a lot of the support that takes place should be delivered, should be given to and received by peers. So people with dementia and carers with yeah. The, the staff, the volunteers, playing more of a role as facilitators of that, that sort of, those sort of relationships to build. Um, and we were struck as to, as to the role of sort of this, this more co-produced idea of peer support um, coming through. Um, and then the third thing I'd probably raise as well, just to finish off, was in relation to the social return on investment analysis, um, and we make this clear in the report, and I, I talked about this in the presentation, that it is in, really important to note that the differences in the values generated doesn't mean one service is better than another. And we really want to sort of encourage people not to think about the, the results of the SROI in that way. But what I will say that was striking was actually the, the degree of magnitude of social value that was generated across the projects. We, we expected there to be positive social values and that there have been previous uh, projects looking at the, the social return on investment associated with peer support projects that generate that suggested that you know significant value was generated. But we were struck so to the point where we, we had to sort of double and triple check our analysis about the magnitude of, of value that was, was generated. So um, I think that what what that element of this evaluation does is gives a really strong sort of steer towards. Um, other organisations, other agencies, agencies that fund this type of work, and this is going to be particularly important once the LCT closes its doors, it does give a a, a really sort of short and sharp answer where where these organisations can say, look, this is the value that we generate, this is the good that we do for people with dementia and carers in a way that, sadly, is important for policymakers, for example, to see and to understand those messages. It's those kind of messages that are at least as important as as the sort of the more um, experiential accounts of the benefits of peer support. It shouldn't necessarily be that way, but but it is unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I would say the third thing was was actually just the magnitude of benefit that, that appeared to be generated through that form of analysis. Really did strike us. Thanks very much, Grant. That's really, really good to hear and the really important points um, and reflections that you've made. So thanks for that. So we've come to the end of our q and panel session. These sessions always go in so quickly and we're always running out of time. But as I say, I'm sure people on the webinar will connect um, with people on the panel um, after today and at a later date. It's been a great discussion and I think it's really just added to the depth um, of the learning that we've already heard today. Um, from the films, from the animation, and obviously from Grant's presentation of the findings. Um, all of this will be available very soon on our website, so those that have not been able to engage fully today or haven't at all will be able to, to get access to that soon. So I'm going to say thank you to you all for joining us this morning um, and answering the questions and, and kind of stirring up that debate and discussion, which is always really, really important, and also just for taking out the time to, to join us. So um, thank you and I'll bid you farewell if I may. So just a few closing remarks from me before we sign off for today. Um, I think we all agree it's really important that this evidence and learning um, shared today continues to influence policy and practice at a local and at a national level, including local dementia strategies, the current Dementia COVID-19 Action Plan and whatever a fourth dementia strategy may look like in the future. As well as this, there is the a Connected Scotland strategy for t- tackling social isolation and loneliness and also the consultation underway at the moment for health and social care for older people strategy. And I know that many of you on the webinar today will be aware about this and, and already responding. This needs to include identifying ways, um, and Grant touched on this around the SROIs, of establishing long-term peer support initiatives that are innovative and sustainable 
and which can operate alongside existing services as part of a continuum of approaches to supporting and empowering people with dementia and unpaid carers. Peer support coexists with dementia-friendly communities and with meeting centres who complement each other in creating a solid local approach to post-diagnosis support, which then satisfies both national aims for dementia care and a grassroots approach to highly personalised care. Most importantly, and we've said this several times today, they are all about partnership working, sharing of learning and active mentoring relationships. And so we are at the end of today's webinar and it's been a real pleasure to chair this event. I've really enjoyed it and I hope everybody else has too. A call to action for everyone today is that you take away some of the learning that you've heard about and you've networked about and chatted about and share it with your peers, your communities and your projects and in the organisations that you represent. I'd like to thank all of our speakers who have taken part today and all of our panellists and a huge thank you to all of our projects who gave their time to make the evaluation and this event possible. We will email everyone with the link to the recording of this webinar very soon, where you will also find the report from Stirling University and individual summary reports from the projects who took part in the evaluation. We will also share this link on our social media channels. And finally, thank you for supporting today's webinar. It's been brilliant to see the chat buzzing and people connecting and sharing ideas and sharing contacts. And, and we hope um, that you enjoy the rest of your day. And it's all that's left for me to say is goodbye and thanks again.